Hi, I'm Mike Redden from Chamonix IT Consulting. I'm here to talk today about the Power Platform, a suite of low-code and no-code software development tools built inside the M365 platform, which in itself is built inside the Microsoft Azure platform. Carl Sagan once said that if you wanted to bake an apple pie from scratch, the first thing you had to do was invent the universe. The Power Platform's quite the same. It doesn't make any sense for the Power Platform to live on its own. It doesn't do anything by itself. The only way that it makes any sense at all is in the context in which it exists. And so the first thing I want to talk about today is Azure. Now the first question you might have is why am I mispronouncing the word Azure? If you're Australian like I am, you probably want to pronounce it Azure. But Azure is a Microsoft brand, it's a Microsoft term. And them being American, if you want to watch any of their videos, they'll call it Azure. So I do too. The Azure platform is an everything as a service platform. It covers infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. The number of services in that is just incredibly huge. But sitting at the heart of all of them is a platform called Azure Active Directory. Now much like its on-premises counterpart, Azure Active Directory is responsible for handling identity. Who are you? What's your password? Where are you allowed to log on to? Where can you log in from? All of those different details. But those details then pervade through the entire Azure platform, including the Power Platform. The main reason why Azure is a platform of its own rather than just a series of different services is for that billing aspect. To give that one perspective for Microsoft to give you one credit card number and for everything to be charged through there. But as far as what it's capable of, it's extremely hard to define until you start looking at the detail. So one aspect that we're going to be focusing on today is M365, Microsoft 365. The Microsoft 365 platform could be considered the software as a service component of Azure. It handles all of the different productivity tools and the architecture required to support them. This is also the part of Azure that most business users and most end users are going to be most familiar with although it is in itself still extremely hard to define. As you can see from this slide itself, even Microsoft tries to define Microsoft 365 as Microsoft 365 is designed to help you achieve more with innovative office apps, intelligent cloud services, and world-class security. I don't know about you, but that doesn't tell me anything at all about what it's actually capable of delivering. So this is how I see M365. I see it as a suite of ready-to-use products, many of which you're probably already familiar with. There will be Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, OneDrive, and if you're working in a corporate space, you're probably familiar with things like Stream or Whiteboard, possibly even Forms. All of those products are ready to use the second that you become licensed for them. You don't need to configure them or do anything really, they're just there and ready to go. On the right-hand side of there are the extensible platforms. Now some in the middle, things like SharePoint, Teams and Kzala, you can do some things with out of the box immediately, but they do also benefit from having behind the scenes configuration, governance and management. On that far right hand side, Dynamics and the Power Platform. Dynamics being the, origina the original custom development platform inside the M365 platform, also known across as Dynamics CRM, Dynamics AX, Dynamics FX, all of those products have migrated across into online equivalents, and they have actually evolved to become the Power Platform. A lot of the same technologies that come from Dynamics now serve the Power Platform as those building blocks that everything is built on top of. But the Power Platform itself isn't capable of anything, much like Dynamics, until you've installed, configured, and made sure that it does what you want it to do. So what is the Power Platform? It's a set of low-code or no-code set of tools. What that means is that you don't need to have extensive development experience to start working with the Power Platform. You can jump in immediately and with the click of a mouse and a couple of taps on the keyboard, you have an application that does mostly what you want it to do. One of the key pieces of functionality that make it an incredibly powerful thing is that it allows you to connect different services from a variety of different sources both inside the M365 framework, inside the Azure framework, and even external to all of that. It does trick business users into believing they can solve their own problems. 
I'm being a bit facetious there. There are a lot of things that business users and especially your tech savvy business users are going to be able to go, go in and using the Power Platform immediately solve their own problems. When I receive an email from the boss, send me an SMS. When a new document gets uploaded and it has the sensitive flag applied to it, move it to the sensitive folder. Those types of things are going to be very quick and easy for even your business users to do inside the Power Platform. But that's not all it's capable of. The Power Platform can be broken into five, and rapidly growing, different feature areas. Power Apps, which are for presentation and user interaction. Power Automate, which is used for workflow, automation and business logic. Power Virtual Agents, which are for that natural language user interface, talking and whatnot. Power BI, for analytics and visualization, and most recently, the Power Pages, which is for external facing content. All of these different services are backed by a series of relational databases called the Dataverse, which acts as a single platform where you can read and write data from any of those different tools. First, let's go into Power Apps. Power Apps are, at its heart, a design surface. They're designed so that you can present data that you own either from within that Dataverse mentioned earlier or from one of the thousands of connectors that work through Power Apps and then seek user feedback. Users can interact with this. There are buttons, there are dials, there are drop downs. There are ways that you can automate that and really build a very strong, rich user interface to read and write from those data sources. That said, there are some limitations and because everything works on that front end in the user interface, a lot of the time you're going to want that data processing to happen more behind the scenes. In that case, you would consider your Power App to be the front end of a typical web application. It's the presentation aspect, but you don't want to be doing a lot of your business logic in that area. Fortunately, it is very good at being a front end. It's great in desktop interfaces, but you can just as easily deploy to tablets or mobile phones. As well as that, there is a free tier available for everyone who has an E3 license for M365. So you can jump in and immediately start using Power Apps. All of those design capabilities are there out of the box and all of them work immediately, with the exception of being able to embed maps at the moment. But the ability to integrate with any data source is limited depending on what your license capability is. Next in the suite is Power Automate, also known as Flows. If Power Apps were your front end, Power Automate would be your middle tier, your business logic and your data integration services. It can be triggered from a series of different actions, whether that's a button inside a Power App or whether it's an email being received, whether it's a new row being added to a SQL Server database. There are thousands and thousands of connectors that work with Power Automate, most of which have some form of trigger. In fact, you can even go as sophisticated as having a HTTP trigger, so any other application can invoke a Power Automate flow just from a simple web request. But the real benefit comes from the fact that there are so many connectors and you can pass data between them, and there are less restrictions than there are around the Power Apps. Once again, there is a free tier available to everyone on an E3 license, but to access some of the premium connectors, again, the HTTP connector, some of your SQL Server databases, or some of the larger enterprise applications like SAP, will all require some level of licensing. Next in the suite is Power BI. If Power Apps are your front end and Power Automate is your middle tier, Power BI is your reporting suite that sits over the top. It really takes all of that business logic that has happened within that application that you've already developed and allows you to provide analytics and visualization across all of that data. It works really, really well with Power Automate to allow you to manipulate data, configure it, change it, make it the data you want it to be, and then present it in a way that is uh, exciting and innovative. Quite often, Power BI is considered the end result of an application built within the Power Platform. Once you've collected all the data and you've processed it in the way you want it to be processed, being able to deliver a report to an executive team or to be able to do predictive analytics over trend lines. All of that is possible within Power BI. On top of that, Power BI can actually be embedded back within a Power App. So while the Power App may initially be used just to collect that data and submit it through to a backend, you can then use that same report written in Power BI to embed it within there. Power BI reports can also be embedded within a variety of other applications, depending on what you need it to do. 
Once again, Power BI has a free tier. However, if you'd really get into intense data processing, or once again, if you want to look at some of those more complex connectors, there will be license implications involved. Now we're getting into the newer tools in the Power Platform suite. Power Virtual Agents were released only reasonably recently. Most people would think of Power Virtual Agents as chatbots. And the idea there is that you can define topics which your virtual agent would know about, and then through exposing them through different channels, such as Teams or a public website, even Facebook or Twitter, potentially even email, a virtual agent is able to read the input that it's given, interpret the meaning behind that input, not necessarily the exact terms, and then provide results and responses depending on what uh, topic is triggered. There are some really powerful analytics tools behind there, so you can identify what type of questions are being posed to your uh, virtual agents and what you need to evolve it into. And there are many different channels that allow you to either publish it to multiple locations, as mentioned before, or to be able to escalate to an agent, to a real person somewhere behind the scenes. If the default configuration doesn't give you exactly what you're after, there's also the ability to go into the bot builder framework, which provides a much, much more complex and more developer focused set of tools that allow you to build complex artificial intelligence and response logic based on what your questions are being asked. One of the most powerful things that Power Virtual Agents can do is integrate with that dataverse and integrate with flows. What that means is that you can have a question posed and then it will send through to Power Automate to flow and that may trigger any number of actions because of that huge connector base inside Power Automate. For example, you might have a user request, I need a new mobile phone to a Power Virtual Agent. Now, after having some discussion with that user around the needs of their mobile phone, it may raise a support ticket through a ServiceNow instance because there are ServiceNow connectors to Power Automate. Because that's all completely seamless and invisible to the end user, there's a single interface that is presented to them and all of this extremely complex and otherwise very expensive integration all happens behind the scenes extremely quickly. Unfortunately, there are no free tier of Power Virtual Agents. It is designed more of a developer tool than an end user tool. However, their free trial is extremely generous. If you go to the Power Virtual Agents website, you'll be able to sign up today and get working immediately. The latest introduction to the Power Platform so new even that I haven't got a high resolution icon for it, are Power Pages. Now, Power Pages come from Power Apps. They have a lot of the same functionality. It allows you to have that drag and drop capability to embed content and connect to things behind the scenes. The difference being that Power Pages are designed to be external facing. They're made for your customers, for your potential customers, for your community, for anyone that doesn't work inside your organization. What that usually means is there needs to be a lot more polish applied to Power Pages, and that is evident through the designer interface. It still has all of the same capabilities behind the scenes, but you do need to be a little bit more careful with it. Once again, similar to Power Virtual Agents, there is unfortunately no free tier of Power Pages, but you are able to design and test things without publishing them um, publicly. So finally, I wanted to quickly discuss what some of the complexities may be in actually implementing some of these. So all of these tools, as I've explained today, are fantastic tools that are able to bring a lot of functionality that may have otherwise taken weeks or months of development time right to uh, design time. Um, drag and drop interfaces allow you to immediately connect with your data sources and send data to and from locations that would have otherwise been incredibly difficult but there are two really key things that you need to be very careful of when you are going through this implementation. One is you wanna make sure that you've got the right development team behind you. I'm sure anyone can drag and drop it, but you still need to have a developer mindset if you wanna do complex looping, if you wanna do complex integrations, if you wanna make sure that your data doesn't end up incredibly dirty because you've got business users submitting very dirty data through to your standard interfaces. On top of that, because these products are rapid development products, there's quite often not the ability to have a dedicated team of resources able to go, we're working on the Power Platform 24-7. You may find that 
around um, end of financial year, you have a sudden spike in requirements because all of a sudden your finance teams are really demanding new capabilities. But then as you're going through budget planning schedules, everything dies off quickly. So the ability to upscale and downscale those resources can be quite difficult. As with the difficulty when upscaling and downscaling resources, you wanna be able to provide consistency supportability, auditability, and security across all of your platforms. But if you've got a different developer working on it every single time, and they're not working off a set of consistent uh, tools and patterns and practices, you're never going to achieve that. And you're going to end up with a scenario in which you've got a thousand different apps developed in a thousand different methods, and all of those are at some point going to land back on your IT department for support, which is where we transition across to the problem of governance. By default in the Power Platform, everyone can do everything other than those that are, require a premium license. But what that means is that you can have a Power App or a Power Automate, potentially even a virtual agent that starts moving content around from one location to another, that um, takes all of the tweets published by the CEO and posts them to the company message board. It's an incredibly powerful set of tools, but it can be a dangerous set of tools because of those exact reasons. So the knee-jerk reaction is quite often to just turn off everything, make it so that nobody can do anything, but then you're really stifling that innovation within your organization. As much as it is useful to have a developer set of knowledge behind what you're doing and how you're doing it, you don't wanna stop those people that have got that mindset that are capable of delivering this from doing so inside your organization. It can be extremely difficult to know what you have and where it's located. If it's been a few years since the Power Platform was implemented at your organization and you haven't put, applied any governance over the top, there's a very high chance that there are thousands of apps and flows floating around being used by who knows. Some of those may be business critical. Many of those are probably just tests. The out of the box tooling provided by Microsoft is extremely limited in what it presents to you and what it's capable of giving you. On top of that, to ensure that the data isn't being sent in your organization from secure repositories into insecure repositories, from people who are operating in a sense of trust to people who are operating outside of that sense of trust. It can be extremely difficult to identify where the right behavior is happening and where the wrong behavior is happening. On top of that, the default environment configuration and the default software development lifecycle is extremely difficult. I have got an asterisk in there because you wanna make sure as with the avoiding knee-jerk reaction of nobody can do anything, you only want to apply software development life cycles where it actually makes sense. You don't want to burden your citizen developers um, that have very lightweight applications with your full software development life cycle where it's unnecessary. But with the right environment strategy, with the right governance over the top and with the right data loss prevention policies, you can make sure that only the right users can do the right thing at the right time. And that when they do the wrong thing, you're notified of it. Lastly, you wanna be able to roll out education to these users. You wanna be able to empower them to do everything they possibly can in the platform. And as you would have seen just from this presentation, there is a lot of depth to the platform and even I don't know everything it's capable of. You wanna make sure that information is easily presentable and is intermingled with your policies and procedures to make sure that people aren't doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Thanks for joining me. If you wanted to, if you had any more questions, if any more comments, please head along to our website at www.chamonix.com.au or send us an email. Thanks.